everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. Joining us on the show today is a new guest, Rob McLeod. Rob is currently the CEO of IDM Mining, but he has a rich mining background that we're going to get into here. Rob, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, Hi, Colin. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a real pleasure getting you on. You have a uh, very strong background in mining. In fact, you founded Underworld Resources, which was ultimately bought out by Kinross. And I'm going to start by asking you to tell us a little bit about that story, how you got involved in the Yukon there, and the aftermath of the Yukon after the uh, buyout from Kinross occurred. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, I've, I've uh, you know, my, my history in mining, it uh, goes way back to basically the day I was born. I'm a third generation uh, miner. Uh, both my father and grandfather were, uh, were underground miners working throughout uh, British Columbia and Alaska. And I grew up in uh, the mining town of Stewart, uh, which is uh, located near uh, IDM's Red Mountain Project. And so, you know, I always uh, loved the industry, had a fascination for the, the natural world and, and for rocks, and uh, knew this was always a career that I, I wanted to uh, pursue. And, you know, I love being from uh, northern Canada, you know, love working in the north and know how to explore. And uh, in, um, in 2007, I had formed uh, with a couple of partners, Underworld Resources, and uh, thought that the Yukon was uh, an ideal place to look for uh, uh, bedrock load gold, gold sources to the you know abundant placer uh, historically and currently producing uh, placer beds up there. And so in, in 2009, um, we drilled a uh, a, a large uh, golden soil anomaly. You know, often it's, it's a uh, preferred exploration tool for us geologists to go and if you can't see any rocks, you go and sample the dirt or sample the overburden and look for anomalies that uh, that lay underneath. And our uh, our discovery hole was uh, over uh, 100 meters of three grams per ton gold, and it precipitated uh, in uh, in '09 the the largest staking rush in the Yukon since the Klondike. So it was uh, really fun to be you know part of history. And uh, uh, subsequently, in, in the following year, and we already had Kinross as, uh, as a shareholder and a great relationship with, uh, with that major, uh, they took over uh, Underworld in, in 2010 uh, um, and, uh, you know, really kind of represented the, the, the peak of the excitement that the Yukon Gold Rush, uh, the second Yukon Gold Rush, uh, had, and you know, there's still been some other uh, successes up there, such as uh, ATAC Resources and and uh, uh, Ira Thomas's Kamenak Gold, uh, where they're looking to uh, develop a mine basically across the Yukon River from Underworld and now Ken Ross's White Gold Project. Having a major shareholder from from a major or getting bought out by a major is kind of the holy grail of of building a mining company. So congratulations on that point. And I want to talk to you about what people should be looking for today. There's, there's many different ways to speculate. We're at the bottom of a market. Uh, one, one way to go about it is investing in, in a project that has very, very high capex and low grade and hoping for higher gold prices. But that takes a long time to wait, and those projects simply are not getting financed right now. What are you seeing actually getting financed? What's the recipe to get big investors in and get a mine built? Uh, well, r- right now, with uh, since the uh, the gold prices uh, pulled back from its you know eighteen hundred or nineteen hundred dollar highs and sort of hovering around uh, you know eleven fifty to, to twelve fifty per ounce, um, the the majors and certainly the the mining financiers, uh, those that are still out there, they're looking for high grade, uh, low capex type gold projects, preferably underground or you know sometimes the the, uh, the the low capex uh, heap leach type projects that look like they should generate uh, high rates of return. So uh, you know companies such as Rocks Gold or or Dalradian, um, Integra, uh, you know some some of the companies that have been doing you know reasonably well in this exceedingly challenging market. You know that that's where investors and uh, the, uh, the the groups that are financing uh, uh, mining and mine development 
that's what they're looking for. You know, the, one of the, the, the big uh, kind of mistakes, whether it's the biggest mining companies in the world like Barrick, you know, straight down to the, to the smallest junior, you know, everybody focused on at the top of the cycle trying to make as much metal as possible instead of making money. And, uh, you know, you can't beat uh, a high-grade underground uh, um, gold project that, you know, has rapid uh, uh, payback. It's much less risky for investors. So, you know, it's the, the, another example is, uh, is Continental that's uh, uh, currently exploring in, in Colombia and Red Eagle. You know, these are uh, projects that look very robust at the current gold price and, you know, they're phenomenally leveraged as well to uh, the inevitable increases that we'll see in the precious metal. And Rob, I want to get to a point that you talked about in an article that you wrote for CEO.ca. Uh, it's, it's about climate change, and it's not exactly what, what somebody would think when they hear the word climate change, but <laughs> as, essentially there, there has been melting of ice and maybe growing of ice in other parts of the world, but that, that is opening up new landscapes and it's actually played into the company. You're running a few other companies that you are aware of. What can you tell our, our audience about how climate change is affecting the mining world? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's really fascinating. You know, I'm, I'm a, a geologist, and in, in, you know, in, in my science, we, we look at you know, climate and earth processes in, in long terms, not in, you know, in 10 or 30-year bites. You know, we look in, in thousands and, and mostly millions of years. So you know, I'm not necessarily going to uh, comment on, on some of the hysteria uh, around climate change, you know, the, the, the Earth is warming up, that's for certain, and, uh, and glacial uh, uh, ice sheets and uh, alpine glaciers, uh, they've certainly been melting. And, you know, it, it, it is, I guess you could say it's not necessarily a good thing for the planet, but, you know, one of the few, uh, I guess, industries or individuals that, that do benefit from uh, a warming Earth are us exploration geologists. See, you know, mostly what what we do when we're exploring, like if there's a, you know, a quartz vein that has a whole bunch of, you know, high grade gold in it sticking out of the ground, somebody has likely found that already and it's probably been mined out. Mostly what we do is trying to see what's underneath overburden and that can be forests, it can be arctic tundra, it can be uh, 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 um, desert sands. You know, we use geochemistry and geophysics and, and geological mapping to try and vector in where a deposit might be. It's actually quite rare to see uh, fresh, you know, outcroppings of, uh, of mineralization that no other prospector or geologist has seen. And in around northwestern British Columbia, near my hometown of Stewart, um, over the past decade or so, there's been some remarkable discoveries due to melting ice. Uh, one of the best examples is Pretium Gold, which is located just to the north of us uh, with IDM's Red Mountain Project. Uh, the, uh, the Valley of the King Zone, back in the 90s, was still underneath uh, a small ice sheet. Um, the, uh, the company that, that had the junior at the time, at, uh, a junior mining company called Newhawk Gold, that in fact my uh, uncle was the president of, they knew that there was uh, a high-grade gold occurrence sitting underneath this ice sheet. They could see, you know, at the toe of the glacier in, in the moraine, there is all sorts of visible gold. The, the company was sold in 1991 to Silver Standard Resources, and Silver Standard just inventory ounces back during the 90s and the first half of the 2000s. And uh, it wasn't until around 2005 they came back out to the property and that ice sheet was gone. And there's, you know, tremendous visible gold all over the place. Uh, you know, Predium and Valley of the Kings is a very special deposit. Uh, you know, there's not really any global uh, uh, comparison to the, the grades of gold and silver that they get within these high-grade veins. And uh, it's recently melted out from under the ice. Uh, the uh, Seabridge is also nearby. Uh, they have their KSM project. I worked on that project in the, uh, when I was an undergraduate student in 1990, and uh, it was just current sulfurettes. Uh, the Mitchell zone was underneath a glacier. Uh, when Seabridge came out to explore, same sort of time, 2004 to 2006, 
they found all this gold and molybdenum and copper mineralization, and that was the Mitchell zone, which is, you know, oh man, it's uh, over 10 million ounces and uh, and uh, significant room for uh, expansion. So, you know, that's a recent discovery. And at uh, IBM's Red Mountain project, since uh, you know the last round of serious work was done in 1996. Since that time, uh, one of the adjacent glaciers has uh, retreated up to two kilometers and has exposed all sorts of new uh, gold prospects that uh, we sampled during the 2014 season. So, you know, it's uh, it's a really it, it kind of a cool uh, uh, part of, of mineral exploration in Northwest BC that you know there's all this new exposure that that you can that no other uh, geologist has set foot on. And Rob, being up in the Northern Territories doing a lot of exploration there over the years, have you noticed that geologists are actually looking for the next areas that are having these glacial melts and going there to try and stake property, or have these discoveries simply been a consequence of the fact that these areas have been exposed? Um, it, it, it's both. You know, the uh, the claims that uh, where there's been discoveries at, at uh, Predium or at Seabridge, you know, another example in the 2000s, Nova Gold and, and Tech with their Galore Creek property, uh, there's new discoveries there. You know, it was melting on pre-existing claims similar to, uh, you know, uh, at, at uh, our Red Mountain project, you know, claims that have been around since the 80s. So there's new exposure there, but the, there are also some, you know, veteran uh, explorers that have been, you know, working in the Northwest for the past 30 plus years. Uh, if it's... Uh, you know, August or September, and you're flying along in a helicopter. You know, you you fly right adjacent to where the ice is melting, and and you can see what's uh, what's coming out from uh, from underneath. And um, uh, you know, it's it's not uh, say a uh, a pre-planned strategy in a lot of cases. It's mostly just serendipity that you might uh, you never know what might be melting out from underneath. Okay, and last question, I want to ask you specifically about IDM mining. The, the asset that you're building there is potentially world class. It, it meets those criteria of being low capex, high grade, very profitable situation. But a lot of companies, including IDM, are running into the problem of their market cap is under $10 million and there's a capex on, on a project of 50 plus million dollars potentially. How do you go about in this market financing a mine or do you uh, cut back on expenditures and wait for the market to kind of pick up before you go ahead and and try to attain that mine financing uh, it's the the number one thing that most of the different you know and mostly boutique and some larger banks that uh, underwrite mine development is the political risk and permitting so, you know, with our project, uh, we are laser focused on getting uh, our permits in place. You know, Northwestern BC is an exceedingly mining friendly jurisdiction. I think it's one of the best in the world. So uh, we're, uh, we're pulling out all stops and uh, using our, uh, our, our cash through, through equity financing to get the permitting in place and to get, uh, to get uh, our engineering uh, complete. You know, uh, in, in the case of Red Mountain, it's a, it's a fairly simple project. It's it's a, a very high grade. It averages between seven and ten grams per ton, and it's also a, it's a wide ore body. It's a, averages forty five to fifty feet thick, and uh, so it's amenable to bulk underground mining. And since it's underground, it makes it easy to permit. And you know, you don't have a big footprint. Um, you know, we the uh, the uh, First Nations that. Um, have uh, title in the area. Uh, they're they're pro development. They signed agreements with Predium and Seabridge. Um, so you know it's this uh, uh, lower cost work that really adds significant value once you get those permits in place. And then uh, you know since it ha our our project has a rapid payback, there's uh, no shortage of options for project finance. We're to, for a thousand ton per day uh, underground mine, in the first year we'll, we uh, plan on producing around 85,000 ounces of gold. Our capex is only uh, 76 million dollars, and that includes a 10 million dollar contingency. That's eminently financeable, you know, versus some of the big, you know, say open pit, you know, one gram or less type projects where you require billion dollar uh, uh, plus expenditures. 
Uh, so, you know, you can get some, some reasonable terms, you know, through, through debt. There's a lot of different groups that do offtake provisions and, uh, um, uh, and also, you know, there's, there's options through royalties or streaming. Um, and, uh, so, you know, it's it, honestly, it's easier to raise $76 million, uh, to build a mine than it is to raise one or $2 million to go out and drill an exploration property in this type of market. All right. Well, on that note, Rob, thanks so much for coming on. Just a note to all of our listeners, you do write occasionally for our friend Tommy Humphreys over at CEO.ca. You've had some very popular articles uh, sharing insight into the market, into the mining space. So I would urge everybody to go take a look at that. Rob, thanks so much for coming on the program. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me, Colin. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen? Are you too stupid? 